Yes, we are now recording the Smutty Story Hour featuring Jory Favreau. Favreau, Favreau. See, I did it again. <laughs> um, the Smitty Story Hour series is brought to you by the Paul Smith College Alumni Association. Again, if you have questions, be sure to drop them in the chat feature or in the Q&A, and we will get to them at the end. I do want to say Jim in Washington State tells us, yes, they have spring there. Hmm. Um, you can add your name and class year into the chat. So everybody can see where you're from. And Jay is with Amy. We've got two Smitties in Vermont joining us. <laughs> and they'll be on campus in just about a month. Watching their dear son graduate. I love those legacy stories. Love them. <laughs> Stephen Frederick from West Shay Z. <laughs> Let's see how we doing. David Bly, we knew you were here. Class of 81, that always shocks me. I always think it's 90 something. Why do I think I went to school with you? <laughs> All right, Jory, whenever you're ready, okay. I think we're good to go. All right. Hello, everybody. I wish I could see you. I'm so used to seeing students when I teach them. It's very strange for me to not be able to see you. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to even type them as I'm talking. And if it's something on that slide, Heather, just interrupt me and uh, we'll address the question when we're on that slide. So as you might know, I'm telling a story in three parts today about surviving the Adirondacks. And when I put this together, it was cold and snowy outside. And I was thinking from that perspective, but it's spring here today. My daffodils are poking up, et cetera. So, um, a little different view than, than uh, when I first put this together. So I'll start with the story of the snowshoe hares. It is a wonderful study species. It is not territorial. It is not social. They provide very little parental care and they're present and active in winter. And so what this means is they're fairly uncomplicated and they're here and doing stuff when students are here working um, all, all winter. They don't leave, they don't migrate, they don't, they don't hibernate. So they're here and they're, they're available. Plus there's lots of snowshoe hares here. Their ecology is fairly simple. It is everything wants to eat them. <laughs> so there's mammalian predators, a variety of those, as well as a variety of avian predators. So they spend their life trying to avoid being eaten, but also trying to find enough food to eat. And again, the story is pretty simple. During the summer, they're eating herbaceous vegetation. In the winter, they're eating twig tips and bark. Um, it doesn't seem particularly good sustenance to survive a winter. So I think that's part of where this, the question comes from is how do they survive these winters? Also, they've been a wonderful study species because my colleague, uh, Celia Evans has done quite a bit of work um, from the plants perspective on what snowshoe hares are eating. And so she and her students provided browse for students, browse for snowshoe hares, and then monitored to see what they actually ate. And they found that basically snowshoe hares eat what's available. Um, they're not terribly picky, but at the same time, they do have some preferred foods. Again, this is the work of Dr. Evans and her students looking at some preferred foods. So she was able to tell me something about what snowshoe hares eat here in the Adirondacks as I started my work. And the question that we were really thinking about from the beginning here was how do they survive the winter here? As I said, it's pretty tough to survive winters. Um, and so how do, how do animals do this? Well, snowshoe hares, again, don't do things. So it made the story we thought more intriguing. They don't migrate. They don't leave for the winter, they're here. They don't store their energy in their bodies. Think about raccoons, how round they get before uh, winter hits. Um, snowshoe hares, they have to be able to run away and avoid predators. So they can't put on that extra weight. They have to stay agile and be able to run away. They don't store food in other places like tree cavities either. And they don't hibernate. And they don't avoid the cold that much in that they don't have burrows and they don't use that subnivian space, that space beneath the snow. They're on top of that snow. One thing they do is, of course, they change the color of their coat, but not just are they changing the color, but it has a better R value. Literally, the winter coat has a better insulative value than the summer coat. That does help. Um, it's a little denser, it's a little longer, a little, little better uh, insulation. So we started by um, saying, okay, what do we know about survivorship? We know from the literature, they rarely live more than a couple of years, but let's see what's happening here in the Adirondacks. And so this is work 
with one of my students, Connor Sincata. I was hoping some of my students will be on today. If you're here, definitely shout out. I, I want to know you're here. Um, so Connor and I went up to um, a snowshoe hair derby um, in the Northern Adirondacks, and we asked the folks if we could check out all the snowshoe hairs as they came in um, to be weighed and, and uh, recorded for the derby. And so we got our hand on, on hundreds of snowshoe hairs and we were able to age them and sex them and say some other, um, gather some other biological data. So from the data here, Connor has constructed a snapshot of how old snowshoe hairs tend to be. So again, we found what we pretty much expected. So that's good. We've got some baseline data here. That's, that's good stuff to have. Another student, Jessie Gardner, um, spent a lot of time radio tracking the snowshoe hares. She was out there in every season, winter, summer, spring, and fall, and she was radio tracking them. So she was able to tell us something about home, home range sizes. And she also did a great job of showing us home, room, home ranges placed on the landscape. And so each of these colored dots represent locations for a particular snowshoe hare. So the yellow dots are all one hare. And then the yellow polygon around that shows where that snowshoe hair was. So here's data on several different snowshoes. And one thing that she noticed is that they actually shifted their home ranges from summer to winter. And she didn't find evidence of this in the literature where snowshoe hares spend the summer somewhere and then move someplace else for the winter and then move back the following summer. And she documented that with our snowshoes and she presented that at the Adirondack Research Consortium. We also backtracked the snowshoe hairs. Um, this is really fun to do, of course. And we did this, uh, Celia Evans did it with her general ecology class and I did it with my animal behavior class. And you can go out and measure things like the distance between tracks and that'll tell us how fast the snowshoe hairs are moving. We can say something about the activity of the hairs. What are they doing from the tracks, right? Are they traveling, are they resting, are they browsing? We can take measurements such as the snow depth and lots of measurements on the surrounding vegetation like canopy cover. And, you know, one of the keys that we found to survival here is pretty straightforward, um, but it's good to have, again, this baseline knowledge. We found that the snowshoe hares in the winter are basically going to hunker down under canopy cover for protection, and they're going to move quickly through open areas and just move in order to find food. And seasonally, that they shift their home ranges to more optimal habitat in different seasons. So we're starting to get a feel for how do they survive winters up here. And this piece for me really helped me understand this was something that I talked to my students about and I explained this concept. Here's the thermoneutral zone right here. This is where um, an animal's body temperature goes from colder to warmer. It's exposed to colder to warmer temperatures. When it gets to right here where my cursor is here, this lower critical temperature, this is where animals start shivering and they have to shiver in order to increase um, their body heat, right? So we had talked about this in class and one of my students, John Nettermeyer, um, came to me and said, you know, I think for snowshoe hares to survive, when they reach their lower critical temperature, they're gonna to have to increase their activity because in order to have more calories, they're going to have to move more to find food. Remember, they're not storing food in a central location. They're not storing food on their body. So they're gonna to have to move to find the food. We knew from the literature that the snowshoe hares lower critical temperature was negative 10 C. And so he predicted that when snowshoe hares got to negative 10 C, when the temperature outside was to negative 10, that they would start moving more. And he said, can I test this? And I said, yeah, let's do it, right? And so it was really cool. We got some collars for snowshoe hares, radio collars, and we wanted radio collars that reflected activity. So the animals are moving more, they, uh, the beep that we received was faster. And when they were moving slower, the beep was slower. So he could tell by listening if they were moving faster or slower and what they were doing. And the students put the collar on one of their pet rabbits and then watch the rabbits so they could actually see, um, you know, correspond the movement of the rabbit to what they were hearing. And then we put them on wild snowshoe hares. And John <laughs> waited for those cold nights. He went out in not so cold nights also, but in the middle of the winter at one o'clock in the morning, he was out radio tracking snowshoe hares, hoping that it'd be neg below negative 10 degrees C. And if that's not a smitty, I don't know what is. <laughs> so he went out and collected this great data and then plotted the data. And so here's the data from the three snowshoe hares that we had enough data on because they do get eaten during the winter and otherwise go off the air. And when you look at this, you'll, you will notice the negative 10 degrees is marked here with this dot dashed line. So his prediction was when it got here that they should increase in activity. Now, it doesn't mean they can't be active over here. This could be where an owl was chasing them and they were definitely very active. So some, some higher activities here don't preclude his, his um, conclusions here. 
and he fit a regression line. And for my data nerds like me out there, there's the actual data beneath that on the statistical test that he found it to be statistically significant that indeed when snowshoe hairs hit negative 10, and he didn't, he didn't put that dashed line there just by looking at it. That's actually the results from the test saying at negative 10 degrees, it was negative 10.4 degrees that the snowshoe hairs actually started moving more. So another fantastic piece of work um, done by um, Paul Smith students. So just to kind of summarize that story um, relatively quickly there, um, we thought about this in a bunch of different ways. You know, how do snowshoe hares survive? Things like avoiding predation, looking at their tracks and how the tracks varied compared to vegetation. We looked at what they were eating and the value of the food. We looked at thermoregulation. And basically it comes down to for the snowshoe hares outside of having that warm fur coat, um, outside of that, that it's a lot about habitat choice. It's about habitat choice and um, engaging in the behaviors that are needed to survive. So that's the first of the trilogy, the first of the three stories. Um, Heather, if there's anybody has any questions about the snowshoe hares at this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody's typed anything in. I haven't seen any questions come okay. through yet, Tori. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm going to, um, right before I leave this story is just thank lots of folks um, who helped make this work happen. I didn't mention nearly all the students who participated. Um, I see Steve Pop there in the center carrying a whole lot of snowshoe hare traps so that we could catch the snowshoe hares. These are live traps. Um, so they hop in there, the door shuts behind them and then we were able to measure them, put radio collars on them and whatnot. Um, Caitlin DeGrave there's a picture on the far left. Um, that's when we were up at the um, snowshoe hare derby. So those are dead snowshoe hares to make that clear. We're not, we're not mistreating some snowshoe hares in that picture. Um, so thanks to the snowshoe hare derby folks for letting us um, bomb their event and show up and, and collect lots of data and sharing their spaghetti with us. <laughs> um, Dewey um, here in Saranac Lake allowed us to trap and radio track on their property. The Vic also did the same. And there's other students here present, um, Jake Dillon and other students that helped with all this work. So just it's just been a really fun adventure um, with the students working on this question. From here, I'm going to move on to the next one. And again, it's about surviving. So the next picture is more dead animals. Um, and I guess sometimes I take this for granted. I see a lot of dead animals and I don't think twice about it, but I forget science. Other people may not, may not want to see it right away. So there's more dead animals in the next picture. Um, these are songbirds. These are not birds from Paul Smith's, um, but I had seen quite a few pictures like these. The background on this is birds um, tend to migrate at night and the lights reflecting off of buildings can be confusing for them. Or even during the day, the windows can reflect um, sky, they can reflect trees, and the windows may look to the birds as if they can fly through them. And I'm sure if I could see all of you right now and I said, who has ever heard or seen a bird fly into a window? I think everybody would nod their heads that they have had that experience. So you know that birds fly into windows because they just don't see them. Now, when we have some large skyscrapers, and it doesn't matter if we're talking about Baltimore or Detroit or New York City, this is all over the country, all over the world. Um, flying into buildings is the leading cause of songbird mortality around the world. It is impressively um, huge um, how many songbirds die. So this picture represents, many of these pictures will represent a building and the birds that were collected that died by hitting the building during that migration. So some high rise in some large urban center like New York City um, might have volunteers um, that go and collect the birds and then they store them in a freezer all season and they'll do a photo op like this to try and convince folks to do things like turn off the lights in the office buildings before they go home for the night, um, as well as to convince the building owners themselves to perhaps engage in some ways to mitigate um, this many bird deaths. Um, and I'll come back to that at the end. So I had seen these um, kinds of pictures. Um, I knew that there was a lot of efforts to try and reduce bird strikes on buildings um, around the world. And I started wondering, are birds more likely to have this happen on an urban landscape or on a rural landscape? And my thoughts were that on a rural landscape, there's fewer buildings, right? There's Paul Smith sitting there. There's fewer buildings to run into. But on the other hand, are the birds less used to the buildings? Because they're used to this wild matrix of habitat around them. And so are they less um, adapted at avoiding the buildings? Are they, are they more likely to hit perhaps? Um, you know, is there more vegetation around the buildings? So they're more likely to hit? What's going on there? 
So I worked with a group of students that I have listed also on this slide. Um, and again, you'll hear how fantastic they are as um, I go through this part of the presentation. So here's Paul Smith, right? Um, the picture on the left, uh, the aerial um, uh, photograph there looking down, um, you see the red dots and where Paul Smith is, right? And then you see a close up to the right there. And the red buildings are the buildings that we um, identified as the buildings that were going to be part of our study. And so I'm guessing some of you alumni remember some of these buildings um, and know exactly where they are. And you probably have a good image of what those buildings are. So I'm not putting up images of all the buildings because I think some of you know these buildings already. So the students um, searched these buildings um, during fall migration. We searched for two fall migrations and we searched for one um, spring migration season. And the idea is that most of these birds are migrating at night and hitting the buildings at night and to search the buildings as soon as we could after dawn. The literature has shown that in many places where birds hit buildings and fall to the ground, they get scavenged um, by you know, even eight or nine o'clock in the morning. And I've seen red foxes on campus. Um, there's other things that might come and scavenge, other critters that might scavenge those dead birds. So we wanted to be out there at the crack of dawn searching. So again, I've got great smitties here. They're setting their alarm, getting up um, and searching underneath these buildings. And that also leads to why we searched what buildings we did. We didn't really want to search underneath dorm rooms at you know five o'clock in the morning. We thought that would be not appropriate. So that also led to not searching all the buildings. Um, so we did that. We went out and searched all the buildings and collected um, bird carcasses so that we could try and answer this question. Okay, so yes, birds do hit the buildings on Paul Smith's campus. This was not shocking to us. Um, we had many reports of birds hitting the buildings prior to beginning this, and that's probably what also catalyzed the study. There were several times where I was teaching class and somebody would come into my classroom and say, and hold in their hands, a bird say, this bird just hit a window. Um, and a lot of times birds get stunned, they don't die. And so if you put them in a dark box and just let them have a chance to recover and then take the box outside and open it up, a lot of times they'll fly away just fine. So I knew birds were hitting buildings and I was particularly worried about the library um, because there's lots of glass on that. Um, and so that was one, this bird here actually did hit the library. This is where this one came from. So um, fortunately, we didn't find that many carcasses. That's a really good thing, right? Here are the species that we did find where we were able to identify them. Interestingly, the unknown ones were because oftentimes the carcass was already so disintegrated that we couldn't identify it. It doesn't seem very hard to find a bird carcass, but I think sometimes they do get missed. I'm pretty sure of it. Um, if there's enough vegetation, maybe they fall into a, um, a, a bush and they're way above the searcher's head or something, maybe they fall out of the bush the next day. So sometimes we found basically, you know, a pile of feathers and not, not much else. Um, so here's the species that we found. Not very many is one of the takeaway messages. The other um, thing to think about is what species that we were finding and was that unusual at all. We went to the literature for that. These are the top 20 species colliding in Manhattan um, for the period of time there for about 20 years. And so what I've done is boxed around some of the species that we found. And so the species that we found are the species that tend to hit buildings. Um, the one that's on here, juncos, um, that we didn't really find were dark, um, were juncos, right? So juncos are on this list, but we didn't really find juncos, even though there were lots of juncos around campus. Um, but those juncos are here year round. So maybe they know where the buildings are and so they're better at avoiding them. Okay, so the question that we had too was maybe we're still missing carcasses, especially when we're finding a carcass every now and then that's really um, decayed. And so we're thinking, okay, what are we missing? So we started a second phase to the study and that was to figure out how long carcasses last in the Adirondacks, how long they persist. So we set out carcasses of birds um, in a variety of locations, not on campus. We didn't want to train any scavengers to come to campus. Um, we didn't want to influence campus. We did them all off campus. So for instance, I had one um, at my neighbor's um, house um, and the students found other, other places off campus to go put these with people's permission. And we put a trail camera in front of the carcass. And then we monitored the carcass uh, via the trail camera um, to see what happened. And so this is a picture of a skunk coming in and scavenging one of the carcasses that we had put out. But really, we had very little scavenging of our carcasses. The line across the top is the first spring, I'm sorry, it's spring. The blue line is um, the winter part of the study and then the orange one is in fall. And so we put out, you can see how many carcasses ranging from five to 29 carcasses. Generally, the carcasses stuck around and certainly for more than 24 hours for the most part. A little bit of scavenging, but not much. 
Um, and so we were feeling like overall, most of our carcasses probably stuck around and we probably found most of the carcasses. So that's again, a really good thing in terms of there aren't more birds dying that we weren't aware of. We're not missing any, we're not missing any appreciable amount, perhaps 10% of, of the birds got scavenged. We felt like that was a pretty, um, the best estimate that we could do. So I don't wanna show you a lot of numbers, um, but I do wanna break down how we got to this because numbers add up. Um, these are the pennies that add up, if you will. So we found 11 carcasses in fall and then nine the following fall. And so that would be an average of 10 carcasses for fall if those two years are representative, right? And seven carcasses were found during spring. So if we add those together, we could say on average 17 carcasses during the annual migration months. Remember, we only search during migration in fall and spring. So it excludes the other months, but these are probably when more birds hit windows, probably. 10% could possibly not have been detected. You know, that would bump us from 17 to almost 19. Um, and I see it flash sometimes up there, Heather. So if somebody has a question, feel free to, to jump in. So it might be as many as 19, but still a relatively no, uh, relatively um, low number, it seems perhaps so far. Now, remember, we only searched um, about a third of the buildings. Um, and so we were calculating as it gets very complicated to calculate what a building's worth because they're different sizes and some have more windows, et cetera. But saying we basically um, searched, you know, 34% about of the area that they could hit. That then extrapolates about 55 birds dying from striking all the buildings on our campus during just spring and fall. So about 55 birds per year dying um, just during spring and fall. So I don't know what your reaction is to that. Um, but I, you know, you can't help but think, oh, I didn't realize there was that many birds dying here um, every, every year. That was our reaction to that. And so we wanted to take that a little farther and say, well, what about the Adirondacks? So the students um, looked at census data and other kinds of data to do a rough estimate of how many buildings are in the Adirondacks. And then from that extrapolate a very conservative estimate of how many songbirds die annually during migration due to hitting uh, buildings. And so conservatively, they came up with at least 100,000 songbirds die annually during migration in the Adirondacks. Again, I'm not sure, I can't see your faces. It's really hard for me to not be able to see you, but I'm wondering what your reactions are because here it is, the Adirondacks, right? There's wilderness, there's forever wild. Um, this is a place where animals are supposed to be free of human influence, right? And yet it appears that the Adirondacks are not an entirely safe haven for birds coming through. That really struck us. We still don't wanted to put this a bit in perspective. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit numbery here on here, but um, it still is hard for us to really wrap our heads around what was going on. So we decided to look at a bunch of different studies and calculate the number of carcasses that hit each building per day. And so there's a there's a several studies listed there. And at the bottom, you'll see Paul Smith's um, oh, with a typo in it, um, uh, and our adjusted um, adjusted for the de detectability rates. So the students calculated this and, you know, I can't really think in terms of 0 0.08 carcasses per building per day. So we decided to basically standardize it. Um, how many at that rate, how many birds at 10 buildings for 60 days, approximately migration. And so we did that. That gives us a standardized model and we kind of wrap our heads around. So again, you look at it, it seems like Paul Smith is fairly low compared to other studies, which I, I think I would expect. Our buildings aren't very big. At the most, you know, just a few stories. We don't have very large buildings. So probably not surprising that we're on the low end here. Um, but certainly I would say in line with what would be expected in a more urban area as well as other rural areas. So they're not particularly any safer on Paul Smith's campus. And these other rural areas are not like Adirondacks. It's, you know, farm country sorts of rural um, with more development than we had. Okay, so there's the Paul Smith data at the bottom. Okay, so this did, of course, um, lead us really to a, a call for action. Um, and so we started thinking about what can we do to try and make the Adirondacks safer. And so we started something called Bird Safe Adirondacks. And the students um, gathered different materials that are advertised to help protect birds. And we did some research on um, literature reviews of what um, they probably actually provide in terms of safety. And so there's a variety of products out there, lots of them I could talk actually a whole 45 minutes just on how to protect houses and buildings from bird strikes. Um, but what you see up here, you see um, some glass that's not completely see-through by having little dots on the glass. And I bet most of you have seen where they sell 
silhouettes of like a hawk or something that you put on your window to try and make the window more visible so that they're less likely to run into it. Um, so there's a whole bunch of products out there. We put together several displays. So we had glass panes with these different products on them. And the students went to the VIC, they went to the public library, um, and, and also we went to a farmer's market to educate folks about what are some ways to try and protect their buildings. Um, and so really anything you can do that makes your window more visible is helpful. And like I said, a huge range. I, we saw pictures of people that let their kids finger paint on the sliding glass doors during migration season so that birds don't hit their sliding glass doors. Really be creative. You can do anything. You can spend a whole lot of money um, or you can spend a lot less money and, and still make it work. The other thing to think about um, for everybody, because I'm guessing some of you have bird feeders. If you put the bird feeder um, at a distance where when a bird gets frightened and flushes from it and it gets up a good amount of speed, it's more likely to die when it hits your house, right? And so we see there on that graphic, it's kind of giving you an idea of where the safest zone is for your bird feeder. If your bird feeder is closer to your house, they can't get as much speed to hit the window as fast and they're less likely to be killed hitting a window. So actually moving your bird feeders closer to the house within five yards is safer for birds. So that's one thing you can do or move them much farther than 10 yards away. Um, so they're not gonna probably just get flushed off and go right into the window. Okay, so that's a bit on the bird safe Adirondacks, um, the kind of the final wrap up of that project um, for the, that group of students. Again, lots of people to thank on this. Um, the Cullman Foundation who provided some funding for us through the Northern New York Audubon. Um, Paul Smith has a faculty research and development grant. STEM um, is, a, is a scholarship program from NSF. They funded these students um, and they funded them in terms of scholarship money. And this is something I'm incredibly grateful for. Each of the STEM students listed there um, were selected through a rigorous selection process. And then they received scholarship money from NSF um, to offset um, tuition costs at Paul Smith College by participating in these projects. They would have done it for free, but it was nice to see their scholarship money um, be awarded to them also. So that's part two of my presentation. Any Sorry, questions? I just on have that? a couple of yes. comments. Um, Jim in Washington said okay. um, that he believes the bird strikes depend on the window. Oh, and I missed some questions in chat. So we've got more. Um, uh, he says, my mother-in-law had a house in a canyon 15 miles from town of 800 and the windows were so inviting that they as they were large picture windows they had an aviary for watching them and we had many dead hummingbirds every year many others as well right. and even a small hawk it depends on the window and attraction to the house um right. our mountain bluebirds would come to the windows and put their beaks to the windows and then try to fly in by fluttering over and over he also said that he cut their bird strikes down two thirds with the decal stickers. Great. And then I do have a couple of bird questions, it looks like. Okay. What is the expected total population of birds in the Adirondacks? Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> I love, there's so many questions out there I don't know answers to. Um, I don't know. I'm sure we could come up with some sort of estimate, but I don't think I've ever heard a number for that. Sorry, I can't answer that. And. Thanks also for the comments on reducing bird strikes. That's really cool that you were able to reduce that. Um, Doug Brush writes, how does that compare to cats? Audubon says cats kill a few billion songbirds per year. So how many would be killed in the Adirondacks? Um, by cats? I don't know how many are killed by cats in the Adirondacks, but yeah, cats and bird strikes are the two biggest without a doubt. Um, and the bird strikes on buildings actually out, out, uh, out kills the cats, um, as worse mortality than the cats. Yeah. And then big numbers, uh, it, as far as an estimate, I guess, to try and answer that it's tough. There was some work done early trying to do some estimates and it's so hard to estimate this. Um, but they're saying, you know, upwards of around a billion birds per year around the world. If I remember correctly, I should double check that. Um, but yeah, big numbers. And it's not just songbirds, it's ducks, it's woodcock, it's um, egrets, I mean, lots of other species. We just see a lot of songbirds more than anything else. Sure. Um, have you ever tried sound waves to get the birds to avoid buildings? I have not, and I'm not familiar with any work on that. Um, 
kind of related to that. Some folks sell products that are supposed to be in the UV range. Birds can see in the UV range and we cannot. So the idea is if you paint your window with this UV, one looks sort of like a deodorant almost, just kind of roll it on. And so it was hard to find good, um, good data on how well those products work. Um, one concern is some of those might wash off. Um, some of them may not actually be in the UV range, even if they're marketed that way. Um, so it seems like something that we can see is probably a little better just because we're more sure of it. Um, but of course, that blocks our view more, so we might be less likely to put it on. So anything you can do, I would say, is helpful. But yeah. And do you have um, any information on the impact of wind turbines? Oh, there's a whole other thing. So I've been talking about building strikes, but really we could talk about any human created thing that, that contributes to bird deaths and strikes are a big one, right, with, with uh, wind turbines. So there's been a lot of work trying to figure out how do we minimize um, impacts with wind turbines, not just by songbirds, but also by bats. Bats appear to be attracted to the turbines and so they're actually very likely to get hit. And so there's some really good work being done on how do we reduce impacts of, on, on bats. Um, and I know they've done some work on birds too. Again, I'm sorry, I don't know any numbers um, off the top of my head on that. I know I've seen them. There's There are a lot of numbers out there. Um, yeah, yep. <laughs> okay, more work to do for your students, huh? Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, and, and you know, the other piece to this too is we would like to retrofit a bunch of windows on campus, right? So this is where this is going. We do have the sustainability grant on campus that was created by Paul Smith students. They all basically volunteered to have this extra tuition fee that goes into a fund and then we can, as faculty and students, um, appeal to the fund, get some money to do something towards sustainability. And so Kate Glenn and I have talked about putting together a grant through the sustainability fund to retrofit some buildings. Um, so we would like very much to be reporting in a while that Freer and the library and some of the other buildings are not having the strikes that they used to have. So stay tuned for that piece of the story too. Absolutely. I do have a question. Does it have to be yes. the silhouette of a bird or could we put a silhouette well, of say a leaning pine or a bobcat in all the You windows? could. Oh, that's a great idea. I love it. Yes. Yeah, so the idea is basically you're just drawing their attention visually to the windows. So it can be anything. Um, and again, I could keep talking about this, but if you just put one or two silhouettes on a big picture window, the birds are going to see the two silhouettes and then fly between them. Remember, songbirds fly between branches of trees very easily. And so they really only need a little space to fly between. So to really be effective with the silhouettes, you actually need to put quite a few and not have very many spaces. Um, okay. So there's some really neat things with these strings that you can just hang down that don't, don't attract our attention, but they're really close together and the birds won't try and fly through them. So if you want to go even better than the silhouettes, having these strings hanging in front or even a screen on a window can make a big difference. Sure. Um, Yep. Absolutely. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to move on to part three of the story. Surviving the Adirondacks, flying squirrels, and other small mammals. So it starts always with the simple questions, right? What species of small mammals live here? This was my question when I arrived in the Adirondacks, so 16 years ago. And so I thought, okay, that's an easy question to answer, right? I just go out there and I look and, and all the work's been done, right? Um, so taking, for instance, bog lemmings, southern bog lemmings, um, you look at this and you say, Oh, okay, so southern bog lemmings are, you know, definitely here. And then you look at the northern bog lemming and you think, mm, they're, they're not here. That's kind of end of that story, right? And then you go to your next source and you go, oh, this author's telling me that northern and southern bog lemmings are here in the Adirondacks. And I think you all recognize the outline of the Adirondack Park. So those are townships within the park. So they've been noted wherever a township had um, bog lemmings in them. Um, and so, you know, I start to wonder, okay, <laughs> How the one map says they're here and another map says they're not. And there's some really phenomenal sources. So Miriam is one of the founders of the American Society of Mammalogists. He did some wonderful mammalogy research and he actually came to the Adirondacks. So there is some historical literature that I can go to and have been looking at to try and understand like what's here now, what was here that isn't here now and trying to piece this all together. There's also some phenomenal um, data sets. Um, so this VertNet, is actually a database of mammals, a lot more than mammals, but specimens in museums. And so I can go into VertNet and I can look for the Southern Bog Lemming and I can see who has collected it when um, and where they actually found it. So this is just a little snapshot of some of the specimens that were collected here um, in the past. So I feel like I can start to put together the story and I found no, um, no mention of Northern Bog Lemmings in VertNet whatsoever. And there's some other sources I can check also, but we're really in the beginning stages of trying to understand what's actually here, 
now and what was here historically um, in case there's a difference, which there sure could be. Um, another one that I'm really fascinated by is this rock vole, also known as the yellow nosed vole. So again, we see a map there from one source and uh, you know, looking at the rock voles, looks like, yeah, they, they extend down through the Adirondacks, um, they're here. And I look back at my other same source and I say, oh yeah, in fact, it looks like there's probably some records here um, of where the rock voles are. I go to VirtNet and I look and the records I'm finding are basically on Mount Marcy and Whiteface Mountain. Did anybody even search anywhere else? <laughs> How much was searched? Um, we have a lot of questions. If these are the only records on basically Mount Marcy and Whiteface, do we have no idea where else they might actually be in the Adirondacks? They like rocky slopes. They like the rocky talus. So they are most likely to be constrained to those kinds of areas. Um, but we don't have a good sense of, of you know, what was here and is it still here? Okay, so this is some work I'm just starting and it's going to start with some field studies. And so some students have already um, been working with me in terms of starting to set up like, how do we go about um, determining what species are here. And um, trying to get into too much detail. So we will be collecting um, live specimens and seeing if we can identify them 100% um, in the field. If we have something that's fairly difficult to differentiate, like southern versus northern bog lemmings, we plan on grabbing just a little bit of tissue, basically like, like an ear punch when you get an ear pierce, just a little bit of skin tissue. And then we'll use molecular methods to determine if it's northern or southern bog lemming. That's the plan. So this is in the very early stages. Um, so stay tuned to hear more about that in the future as we get going on that. Um, and so the next question that, you know, you might probably guess is I'm wondering how is their persistence affected here in the short term? Um, you know, what's happening to small mammals in the short term um, here in the Adirondacks? And I bring this up because a student came to me and was asking about flying squirrels. This was, I'm trying to remember my, probably my second year at Paul Smith. Um, and so the question was, can they fly, can they glide? Glide, can they glide across Route 3, you know, that runs right past campus? And according to the literature, they sure can. It should be fairly easy for them to glide across that, that road. Um, they'll lose some, some um, height as they go across, but they certainly can make it across. It's not too big of a gap for them to do that. So the student asked, he said, well, can we go out there and actually see if they are crossing um, Route 30 outside the school? So the map inset right there, of course, is Paul Smith's, where the red star is, is approximately where his study site was. The um, diagram here is showing you um, the road that goes right through there. And what you see on each side, the numbers are the numbers of the traps. So the campus side of the road, the opposite side, they have the same number of traps on either side. That's not particularly important, but they have a bunch of traps on either side. The traps are 10 meters apart from each other, right? And Route 30 is 21 meters wide. This is Eric Holt's work. I didn't mention him yet by name. So this is Eric Holt's curiosity who said, let's see if they're actually crossing this road. So he set out the traps and then he checked the traps repeatedly and monitored where the squirrels were looking to see if they were indeed crossing the road or not. These simple questions that, you know, I thought, oh, of course they're crossing the road, we'll find that. Um, let me show you his data here. So this is Eric's data showing you the distance traveled between recaptures. So when he caught a squirrel at one trap and then recaught it, how many meters away was it? It shows a really nice spread of how far they were traveling up to you know, 140 meters away from where he first caught them. Now the road's only 21 meters wide, so that's marked on the, on the figure. So certainly they're capable of traveling much farther than 21 meters. They did that, right? We can see they traveled up to 140 meters. But when he did his work, he didn't have a single squirrel from either side of the road ever be found on the opposite side of the road. Again, like much of our work, it's fairly limited in scope. We didn't do it for, you know, season after season, um, but he was able to say that we have no evidence, at least, of squirrels crossing that road. Again, I find this really shocking because we know a lot about genetics and inbreeding and what happens to small populations on islands. If there's no new genetic material coming in, oftentimes um, a population cannot persist because it doesn't have the genetic diversity to persist. We don't have that many roads in the Adirondacks, but if they're not able to actually cross the roads or at least not cross them frequently, I mean, it appears this road is actually a barrier. Even if they can cross it and they are crossing it, it is still functioning as a barrier. Oh, how does that affect the genetics? We haven't even remotely taken on that question. I'm not a geneticist, um, but I think it's an interesting question waiting to be asked. And we have found out since then, there has been other work just like this down in the um, Smoky Mountains 
um, with the Blue Ridge Parkway, that the Blue Ridge Parkway is bisecting the habitat of flying squirrels and they are not crossing the road there either. So this is not limited to the Adirondacks. So this is one reason why we're asking about, you know, short-term persistence. If some of these small mammal populations are basically islands um, separated by a road, um, how do they, how long can they persist for? Okay. And of course, we're also interested in things like long-term. Okay, if we used to have northern bog lemmings here and we don't anymore, right? Um, we want to know these things. And so the questions that I'll be asking them on sabbatical this upcoming year, and so this is where we're really gonna dive into these small mammal questions and start to think about where are they? Let's document where they are, but let's also um, think about how they might persist into the future or not. And of course, you've, many of you I'm sure have seen maps like this predicting uh, via climate change, how our forests might change over time. And as the forests change, how might that actually change what small mammal populations live in our forests? So short-term and long-term. And I'm, I'm wrapping this one up. Um, so you have a heads up on that. Um, you know, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. I think many of you probably know that um, quote from Aldo Leopold. And that's what really strikes me as I'm thinking about this upcoming work with um, small mammal diversity in the Adirondacks. If we don't even know what's here, how can we work towards protecting it um, and making sure that it continues to fill its role in the ecosystem? All right, really a huge heartfelt thanks to all the Paulson students and faculty um, that have shared I mean, the work over the years um, and the camaraderie. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful. I was hoping some of them would be on this uh, potentially. Um, if anybody is here that I've worked with over the years, please make sure you pipe up and, and tell us, um, but open to any questions that anybody has at this point. I did have one question come in from Ron Perlick. Mm -hmm. I'm curious that there are no rock voles in Pennsylvania, considering they are in the Adirondacks in Southern Appalachians or Appalachian, however you right. say it. <laughs> right. And I, I wish I could comment more knowledgeably about what exactly is going on there. I, I'm wondering quite a bit about how much do we search for things, how much effort was put into finding different species in different places over time. There might be some specimens somewhere that just haven't been in the VertNet database, for example. Um, I, I have a lot of questions about just how do we know what's here before I even get more into the work. Um. I'm waiting for more questions, but as I'm looking, someone logged in as Tree, and I have a feeling that's oh, Teresa Troy. I bet I know Tree. Hi, Tree. <laughs> Teresa Troy, I'm guessing. <laughs> I'm guessing because I don't know many people that go by the name Tree, and I don't even Fantastic. know she goes by Troy anymore. Oh, okay. I could be behind. <laughs> well, I, I think I may have attended an event last summer. Or was it in the fall? I did a few events last summer at um, Tucker Farms and she made gotcha. another okay. name. <laughs> um, Fantastic. Let's see, Pam Nobles has joined us. I'm sorry, I didn't see your name earlier. Karen Frank and Peter Frank. Oh, I've got a question. Have you observed peregrine falcons nesting in the Adirondacks yet? Um, I have not personally, no, I have not. Um, and there are folks who are definitely keeping track. New York DC does a good job of that. Um, once upon a time, I was a wildlife technician. It was actually last century, literally, <laughs> for DEC. And my job was to monitor the peregrines from basically um, New Paltz down to Bear Mountain Bridge. Um, and I also had opportunity to go out um, on some of the other places, Verrazano Narrows and whatnot, those bridges in New York City and see peregrines out there. So I know they do a good job of keeping track of peregrines where they're nesting and asking um, uh, folks to stay away from the climbing routes when the peregrines are nesting there. Okay. Um, Peter Whitchurch says he worked the New York State Small Mammal Study at Huntington Forest, Long Lake Township, summer of 66. Yay! No Some radical. of the best data we have, right? Absolutely. I did a huge shout out. So ESF um, has kept long-term uh, monitoring sorts of things, looking at small mammal tracks and small mammal populations over the years. Really great work. It's phenomenal. Yes. Um, he said- Sorry, I didn't interrupt. Was there another follow-up to that? <laughs> uh, he just said that there were no rock voles or lemmings that year. So- Yep. <laughs> um, add that to your notes. 
Yes. <laughs> um, and it is, in fact, Teresa Troy. Of course it is. <laughs> um, so back in, uh, in the snowshoe hair slides, you don't have to go back to them. I just want to say Katie DeGrave, is it DeGrave? DeGraves? Caitlin, Caitlin DeGrave? Yeah, Caitlin, there we go. Yes. She was in Alaska when I was there last summer and I got to visit her. Um, I can't remember the name of the center. It was a similar to a, a wild Alaska, center. Alaska Sea Life. Right? That's so it. Caitlin's and I went there. there and met her there. She was one of the only Smitties I saw when I was there. Um, it was uh -huh. a personal trip. It wasn't a work trip, but I couldn't not go see her. And right. she's now in North Carolina. <laughs> so I'm really excited. I'm she is. hoping to see yes. her again. Um, she was working with penguins yeah, in Alaska, which was really cool. And she was totally into it. You could tell she's definitely more of a penguin yeah. person than a person person. <laughs> <laughs> she loves her she's a good person person too yes he is she yeah. definitely is i know the wildlife degree is new since um some of our alumni went to paul smith and if you aren't aware alums um our our fish and wildlife alumni really go all over and they'll set something like i want to work with owls i don't care where and then off they go to arizona or southern right. california and exactly work with owls. or they say i really want to work in alaska i don't care what species i work with i just want to go to alaska and then off they go right um, and she really did it's right. amazing where our students are. I just, just to give you some idea too, I mean, our students head off to graduate school also. I hope it's okay to say some names. I guess it's all public knowledge. Um, we have a grad student, we have a student who graduated who's now working on her PhD in Maine on moose disease ecology. We have a student who's working on a graduate degree down in Brownsville, Texas, um, looking at um, small cats and carnivores crossing the roads down there. And they're using trail cameras to look at things like ocelot mortalities by cars. Our students are all over the place. And I'm sure alum realize this because you run into them everywhere, but I'm still just so in awe of our students and all the cool things they do. Sure. sure. <laughs> We've got um, Cassandra McEwen is out in. Um, she just went out west. Yes, um, the Grand Canyon. Um, she's doing bird stuff out there and don't ask me specifics because I don't know. Um, I just know she was super excited and started talking in Latin and I don't know. <laughs> she was so happy. Um, let's yeah. see. I've got a couple more comments, a comment. Um, the questions that students come up with always amazes me. My own students and yours as well. Yes. Whoever made that comment, I, I assume you're a teacher somewhere. I'm curious, are you a science teacher? What do you teach? David, if I say your name wrong, I'm sorry. Is it, I don't think it's Spoonable, but. David Spoonable, we know him. Spoonable. There we Town. go. Sure. I have to hear it once. <laughs> yeah, he's a well-known well educator in Beekman Town. Excellent. Oh, Beekman Town, fantastic, yes. No, isn't it fantastic? I will teach the same class I have for like 15 years. Every year in natural history, students ask me questions that nobody else has ever asked me and I have no idea what the answer is. And I say, well, let's go find out. And we've looked up all kinds of cool things about giraffes and everything else over the years. I mean, it is, I just feel like students' minds are just the right primed place to just think off in any direction and come up with such cool questions. And he teaches earth science. Okay. He, um, he answered back and he said, um, they don't allow rock climbing at Poco Moonshine during period peregrine breeding season right very cool and and honestly a shout out to the rock climbers i understand overall as a group they're pretty good i mean they they want to abide by these regulations i'm sure it's tempting but i i understand that most rock climbers are pretty good at, at obeying those regulations absolutely yep. do we have more questions for jory this evening they're kind of quiet you covered a lot. They're probably all putting decals on their windows right now. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Jory, you mentioned you're going to go on sabbatical. What will you be? What, what's your project? What are you going to be? So studying? it is looking at small mammal diversity of the Adirondacks, and I'll stick mostly, you know, around campus northern Adirondacks, um, just for logistic reasons. But my what I'm getting so far from looking at the literature and the the big data sets, the databases. I don't think we have a good sense of what was here, much less what is here now. And so it's gonna be hard to move into the future without documenting some of that. So we're really hoping to document, it's hard to document some things not here. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to document some things are here. I say some things, some small mammals. No. Uh, a question. And other, actually, Northern and Flying Squirrels. Can I just jump in real quick? Northern and Flying Squirrels, right? 
we can tell the difference when you have them in the hand. You can look at their belly hairs and figure out which they are. I don't think we really have a good sense uh, for sure which ones are where in the Adirondacks. And I'm pretty sure that's gonna change over time. We're gonna see more Southern and less Northern. But unless we document that now, we won't be able to say that it actually changed. And it'll change because climate change, right? Um, so that's, I think, a really important question too. So what is your favorite Adirondack critter, Jory? <laughs> I don't have favorites. <laughs> it's like asking a mom who their favorite is. I really don't. Um, a lot of times I just tell students, I'm really motivated by the questions and then it's whatever species helps me answer those questions. I'm mostly a mammal person. I'm mostly a bird person. I don't know as much about herps or fish. Um, but what I'm really interested in is animal behavior. And I'm interested specifically in why they move about their home range like they do. So not migrations, not dispersal movements, but in their home range, when they get up in the morning, why do they go walk up that ridge versus go that way? Um, and so that's what I've looked into mostly. And that's how I ended up starting off with snowshoe hares. I thought they're gonna be easy to figure out and they're relatively easy compared to more complex species, but yeah. <laughs> um. Is the bald eagle, eagle frequently sighted in the Adirondacks? Ooh, um, I would say there's more sightings now. Obviously, there were decades ago, for sure. Um, and, you know, we even worry a bit about them feeding on, say, deer carcasses on the side of the road in winter. So DOT picks up deer carcasses so bald eagles don't get hit. Um, so such a, I hope this isn't too much of a doubt, all the survivorship mortality, that's what I'm thinking about. Um, but the other thing, of course, is lead poisoning. Lead poisoning is still an issue for bald eagles. DDT was the issue, you know, back in the 60s and 70s. Um, but more recently, the issue has been lead poisoning. So as you know, lead builds up in prey species, then it magnifies, it builds up, builds up. And so it gets eaten by the bald eagles when they forage on the, and they scavenge on those species. So we do still see lead poisoning. It's, there's still work to be done there. Oh, and I could talk about lead free and all that stuff, but I won't do that today. <laughs> You guys should anyways. All of you that love animals, try not to use lead where you don't need to. Um, I'm thinking like hunting and fishing. Um, don't forget we took lead out of gasoline. We don't allow, you know, paint on the walls that has lead in it to be eaten by small children. You all know this from when you buy a house. Um, and so if you can hunt or fish lead free or reduce the amount of lead you leave in the environment, it makes it, it makes a real impact on everything from bald eagles down to shrews. I worked on a study years ago where we were collecting shrews and looking at lead levels in shrews. They're eating the earthworms that are in the soil where the lead was, right? And so this is a problem. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> More than you wanted to know. Okay. I'll no, stop. <laughs> it's all about the circle. <laughs> all about the circle of life, right? Yep. Um, I can say um, I've seen eagles just across from my house. And last year, it was amazing. I was at a Boy Scout meeting at the Fish and Game Club, and they were outside doing, I don't know what they were doing practicing building fires or something and i look over and i see an eagle flying over the river and then i see three more they were playing it was the most amazing thing and i'm like stop what you're doing look where you are look what the and they're like uh-huh that's cool and they went back to what they were doing and i'm like you don't understand 30 years ago you wouldn't have seen this right it's just right. it's amazing for granted right <laughs> right. There's a nesting pair on Oceda Lake and Saranac Lake. Well, I can't find the nest near my house, but I know there's one close by. <laughs> Way more now than in the thing. 60s and 70s. I almost never saw eagles when I was there in my teens and 20s. I can usually go somewhere and see one and more, one or more kayaking on a regular basis. Yep. Well, there's a good news story maybe to end the day on is that there are more bald eagles, not just in the Adirondacks, but New York and the United States. They have done a wonderful recovery. It's been a great success story. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Jory, um, I think our questions um, have run out. DDT took 40 okay. years to make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It takes a long time when you only have one or possibly two chicks or so at a time. It takes a long time to recover. Sure. Okay. Jory, this was fantastic. I mean, uh, that, uh, that was so fun and educational. Uh, so thank you very much. You're welcome very much. <laughs> thank you everybody for coming. Um, when I run into you somewhere else, be sure you say hi um, in person so I can see you. <laughs> and this will be available on our YouTube channel and on the college's website. So Tell a friend, say, hey, go check out that great presentation Jory did. Uh, it'll be available for review. Absolutely. Okay. Um, as are all of our Smitty Story Hours, we record them and then post them to our webs 
site and YouTube channel. It takes a day or so. I'm not very IT savvy. Um, so I have people to do it for me and they're busy. So um, give us a couple of days and this presentation will be up there as well. Um, and Jory, can you just tell us where we can follow you online because your, um, your natural science social yes. media is very so, active. Oh, that's a good point. I, oh, at the bottom of the slide, um, see where it says at PSC NatSci. That should help quite a bit. I am not a social media person either. I should be more into it, I suppose. But um, we have a Facebook page. So if you look for Paul Smith College Natural Science, you'll definitely find us. We have an Instagram. We're just starting the Twitter thing. Um, and we have a YouTube channel also. Um, I'm trying to think And a of whole series of brand new videos coming out. Oh, we Stay do. Yes. tuned. I've yes. seen them. They're fantastic. We're hoping um, Beekman Town to have some videos that high school teachers can use. Um, the idea is that we do enough of this thing, like, you know, how do you identify these trees? How do you spell mammal trap that we can put up a series of videos? So we're starting to build those up a little library for high school student, uh, high school teachers to use. Yep. That's awesome. If anybody else would like access to any specific videos, let us know too, and we'll, we'll see what we can do. That's great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us yep. this evening. Um, we'll see you in a couple weeks for the next Smitty Story Hour, um, where we will be featuring um, Joe Canto, class of 85, and Jamie Berdowski, class of 2005. Um, I like having alums um, come back and um, share some knowledge with us. Should be a fun time. Um, and thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Good night. Story. Good night. This was a fun one, Steve. We still have a couple of folks on with us. It, uh, it was fun. I, I I was sitting in the edge of my chair. Uh, you know, Jory gets a little excited and she's quite passionate about her topic. So absolutely, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, for a couple of years, she would do a radio tracking uh, class uh, during reunion for us. And she would, you know, she would hide some of the monitors somewhere and take people out and teach them how to track and it was really cool one year she couldn't do it and i had um an alun ben Tabor. he works for dc and he came and did it for me one year he actually in his career was um tracking moose um in the That's adirondacks wild. and like it's just amazing you know he goes up in these little planes and has a pilot and flying around tracking a moose and i'm like this is crazy but I love that they do it and that they they are so willing to share with others. The Smitty spirit. It is. When she said, you know, they were getting up at all hours to go look for, you know, birds and what. I'm, I'm not surprised. <laughs> not yeah, at all. They, I'm glad they avoided the res halls. That would be a little. Uh, yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. But all right. Well, boss, I think I'm going to go home because you expect me back here in 12 hours. Yes. <laughs> Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Oh, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Have a good night. All right. Take Thanks. care. Bye-bye.